this week on Hermitcraft. I don't know. I thought it was embarrassingly delightful. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixel Riffs. Our writer is Loy XP, and it's the week after Halloween, which is when we cover all the Halloween stuff, apparently. Upload schedules are a thing, as we ever are reminded, but it's not like having a bit of that spooky cheer is a problem in this, a show run by a zombie and a guy with a pumpkin for a head. Still, the scariest part of the past seven days was watching some hermits encroach on the idea of actually finishing some of their bases, which I have to point out would mean their hands are no longer tied, and who knows what they'd get up to. Public petition for Pearlescent Moon to add a few more wireframes to everyone's places aside, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Azuma Void and his impressive array of creepy crawlers. You see, one surefire way to prevent snow from piling up on your Minecraft roof this Christmas season, aside from actual fire, would be covering it in string. Pity then that X has none of it. The solution comes in the form of a spider-only natural spawn mob grinder, which limits the spawn spot only to those fit for an arachnid. Funny how most mob farms like that usually try to do the opposite. This means that we have 1,152 spawning spaces in this thing. Aha, are you going to do what I think you're going to do? Yeah, you're going to fall down there. It's also funny how on his way there, X just had to fix his bone meal farm that wasn't even that broken to begin with. Just a little aside to remind us all that a Minecraft base is never done. Not until it has a giant jack-o'-lantern on it. False Symmetry's Halloween episode sees her decorate the swamp lands with a seasonally disemboweled squash, as well as a few adorable voxel art bats to accompany her giant eagle in the airspace. I mean, they're going to look much better at night time, but I just wanted to see what they look like during the day too. Yeah, they're kind of cool. <laughs> I like them actually. The rest of the video is spent checking over the profits at her redstone shop and checking how close Ijevin's own atmospheric swamp land has gotten. So much so that this guy is vibing out over here. He's having a great time. He's having a, He's having a whale of a time. Hey, look at him. Now, Jevin has his own pumpkin patch to take care of, but either the jagged edges of the slime pit he lives in or the adjustments to make his shulker farm more reliable can't be described as anything but finishing touches. Grab a stack of eight iron blocks out of the chest and rename them with your name in the anvil. On the left side, you will either get a trick or a tree. That's pretty straightforward. And the finer detail will have to be set aside to the next capital B big moves he has pulled in his latest video. Emphasis on capital here. Jevin finds himself roaming the server with a set of mystery shulker boxes filled with goodies of all kinds, including an honest Jevin IOU. The trick here is that you don't pay with money. Blow yourself up right here. Yes, awesome. Watching his server mates do a flip for him is not it either. The most enticing part of this door-to-door -door soul salesman shtick is that the maximum bets earn him a part of the other hermit's property. And the hermits quickly shill over Zombie Cleo's bee church, XB Crafted's giant horse head, and False Symmetry's swamp attic. Oh, I can, uh, I can oh, yeah. really see myself living here and owning yeah, this it's area. It's good, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. it's got a nice breeze um, yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah, lots of airflow. What Jevin plans for those properties? Well, it couldn't be worse than what Scar planned for his own arrangement of other people's attics. The Botum official's decision making is generally thrown for a loop now that we mention it, seeing as how Grian wants people to be yeeted around on slime block launches. Head of meetings, not Redstone, he still pushes the responsibility of the actual system on somebody else, but put a pin in that, it will come up later. Really, Grian takes the whole server for a spin and gives us a nearly complete tour of the discovered hermit lands, highlights of which we present in an orderly fashion. This! Oh, uh, the okay, I'm, uh, I'm. I, there's, there's, there's some, look at that, that bright, that looks like Shrek Swamp. It's just so cool. I really, I still own this attic, by the way. I At his own base, however, Grian makes sure to complete the bend of the facades and christens the resulting street Midnight Alley for the artificial starry sky over the many shops. I have made a crucial mistake, but the great news is you can't tell unless you're in the right angle. I love the right <laughs> angle. <laughs> I scared you <laughs> 
I scared you for the first time! Oh, you did! <laughs> a much more direct arrangement of copyrighted material comes with Zombie Cleo, who goes all out for Halloween decorating and makes her own haunted house, ghosts and spirits sold separately. The standalone build of Cabin in the Woods stands alone in the Darkwood Forest, but resembles the actual poster for the movie Cabin in the Woods far more than an actual cabin. Inside, Cleo puts together a menagerie of horror memorabilia assembled through armor stands, custom heads, and trickery of the eye. Quite fitting that she had to get killed multiple times to drag these textures into the game, but she's already a zombie, so that's not much to lament. Over here we have Freddy's Claws, which I'm quite pleased about. That I enjoyed making these. These, This was the one that I really wanted to do, so um, yeah, so I did them. You get me. I definitely, definitely needed to make this. Definitely did. We have more sites to show you. Why, here's Coralis at the Big Eye shoreline, filling in a base worth of B00's wireframe plans. The shiny architecture is not yet meant for shops, so its main task being look pretty, we can assure you it does that. So does Coralis, having gone on a moonkin hunt at the bottom and come back with a fresh set of pumpkin antennae. Little balconies, like quirky shapes all over the place, and those bushes. I'm in love. An interesting accidental spooky occurs with Cubfan135. On his everlasting quest for a custom super biome, Cub gets stuck on needing more crimson and warped roots, of all things. It being basically a grass farm but nether coloured, that's not much of an obstacle, of course, but then Cub decides to farm Nylium itself as well, just to complete the large purple room of bone mealing the nether. And that's when, thanks to 130 bone meal dispensers, we get the miracle that is cyan carpet that's alive and crawls at you. Magnificent. Okay, so this area is now completed. That's pretty awesome. And just one more time here. Let's go ahead and activate the farm. Let's... Aw, yeah. Look at that. I love it. The server now has minigames, which means it was only a matter of time before XB Crafted and Coralis met up for their latest head-to-head -head challenge. I admire your resilience. Like, you keep losing time after time, and yet you keep coming back for more. It's all fun and games until someone loses a zombie. That This was the practice round we've been waiting for, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> we I'm had a practice pra round already. No, my zombie died. <laughs> my zombie died on the practice round. They're considerate enough to recruit a new zombie, although he lacks the stylish headwear of his predecessor, and while he's equally sinister, he's a little less dexterous. While Mumbo has no blood on his hands yet this season, he also doesn't have any fake blood, by which we mean, of course, redstone dust. I have been like, <laughs> I've been scraping by on like one stack of redstone for so long. Oh, oh really? That's not very good. Well, you might be pleased to be informed that I have almost a double chest of redstone ore. What? For your convenience. Why do you have this much? <laughs> what are you? What? This is because I mine a lot. Luckily, Pearlescent Moon comes to the rescue and even helps him test out the slime block launcher he was planning to build with all of it. The contraption is, of course, for Botum Inc.'s next company meeting, which means Mumbo has to make sure it's functional and doesn't murder everybody, especially since he'll be absent and won't get to watch. I oh, no, say wait. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> Yes! <laughs> My machine! <laughs> what a successful yeah, machine! By the time Impulse SV is called in to test it, the employee launcher is on its third or fourth iteration, but is both safer and much more chaotic looking. To add some orders into the chaos, Mumbo adds an effigy of himself built into one wall, programmed to dispense his CEO input for the meeting via either automatic or manual outputs. And since this is effectively a giant Mr. Potato Head, all his responses are carved into baked potatoes. We sense Mumbo is taking being a YouTuber a bit too seriously. Well, this is painful. Oh, this is painful. Impulse SV's latest video explains why we might not have seen much of him for two weeks. Sparks fly and blocks go brrr as he adds not one, but two enormous sections onto the iDimpy Bar factory. We've got this building as you saw me build, and we've got this smoke stack or smoke tower or whatever we're gonna call that. Yeah, it's a little thin. I'm done. I just, mm. I, I've been working on this for like weeks. As he sails down from the new smokestack, he finds an enormous line of trick-or-treaters have queued for a stroll around the candy garden, which now has some lovely new additions courtesy of Gemini Tay. The exterior of that room gets a little love too, and after helping Mumbo with his latest juggling act, Impulse decides to start making more use of the factory interior, starting with a cactus farm so he doesn't have to keep outsourcing his cyan dye from Joe Hills. 
which I'll probably call a sugarcane farm many times because I always get that confused. Joe's efforts are firmly elsewhere this week, not least because Halloween gives him the excuse to buy a spooky custom book and quill from Wells Knight's shop and use it to write some uh, inventive crossover fanfiction. One day, Asuma and the Mandalorian were hanging out at the draw. Oh no! The intervention by phantoms might actually have been a good thing. But while clear-cutting the swamp near spawn may have been Joe's main objective, it doesn't end up as a last-minute Halloween district. In fact, many of you may have spotted it being decorated for this weekend's Love Tropics charity event. They didn't like my story very much. Maybe they found it so embarrassingly bad that they fled. I don't know. I thought it was embarrassingly delightful. Tinfoil Chef also spends his week considering decorations. As his traditional branch mine is shaping up, he now wants to accessorize it. Down the middle of the mine shaft, there will be minecart track. The question is what blocks to use, what look to have. This means getting to grips with some of Minecraft's newer features, since candles are now an option for lighting and aesthetics. At least he can be sparing with them if he keeps the shroom lights on throughout his diorite slab ceiling. Uh, I will say that I do actually try to read most, if not all, comments. This is a little bit of a variation on that. Evoking a grand yet cozy feeling is also on Iskal's to-do list, although we can be certain there's a lot less diorite. An enchanted, cozy, grand, mysterical forest. The entrance to his and Etho's shattered savannah base is slowly transformed into a lush path, although he has to give the azalea trees some words of encouragement before they'll grow the way he wants. That's... Oh, I wish it was tilted the other way, though. Uh... Yes, I got one the right way. As he hides all the less desirable stone types, both the main gate and water elevator also get a makeover, which is even more appropriate when you consider the gateway looks more than a little like a face. That is so fancy. Oh, I love the tinted blocks. If your cat food is made of vintage beef, you're probably treating your cat pretty well. But if it's made by vintage beef, it seems doomed to be neglected by the rest of the server. Until Beef has the smart idea of setting up a few free sample stands with exemplary customer service. By setting up an enderpearl teleporter inside the stalls, Beef can be there within an instant when a customer approaches. Um, hmm. Whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Howdy. Oh, hello. Hi. How you doing? Oh my god! Well, I just uh, I, this is the 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 patented um, teleportation device. Both Dokem and Cleo are given the pitch for chorus fruit cheesecake and sugar coated ravager teeth, respectively. And despite these sounding like food crimes, the pair of them are pretty convinced. Having acquired little currency, Beef goes for gold by picking up some turtle eggs to get started on a zombie pigman farm. I feel so bad for this turtle. It's looking at me like, uh, you just stole my babies. Anyway, now I need some more things. Rendog has been raking in the profits too, although he's having to rake them into the barrels, because the hermits are used to the Indiana Jones method of payment, where you swap the thing you're taking for whatever retextured bag of sand you paid with. For some reason, they're just not using the system correctly, which is very strange because it's a very simple system indeed. It's very obvious. Pay in the barrel. And Ren is doubling down on that, retexturing the entire Octagon Island with white concrete powder and later returning to reform it into a dead coral reef rising from the surrounding ocean. Uh, it's taken me a couple of days to do this though, so I've kind of had enough of this terraforming project for now. Which is where Doc M's new item shadowing technology will come in handy. Ren gets a primer on how to use it, and making sure he can restock his materials remotely will surely help on such a massive project. It saves him enough time to write a strongly worded letter to Octagon's customers, emblazoning the words pay in the barrel on the wall, and while he's at it, converts all the Spider Walker shulker shops into billboards advertising the Octagon. But guys, if hermits come into the shop and they don't see the giant pay in the barrel banner that now encirculates the interior of the Octagon, then that's basically going to prove that the hermits are incapable of reading signs. And finally, there's Etho, who might be part of the reason Shulker sales haven't been that great. Uh, I made a deal with Doc. Well, oh, quickly crossing the island. <laughs> Get out of here. Thanks. Following through on Doc's deal for unlimited Shulkers, he munches his way through a half a chest of spider eyes while breeding donkeys, requesting a sugarcane farm from B00, and decorating the important rooms inside the Savannah base. 
This includes a wall of green shulkers, which now collects all the outputs from his various bone meal powered farms, and the control room comes together beautifully. Poking his head outside, he casts an approving eye over Iskal's terraforming, and the other eye is puzzled but delighted about B-Dubs' redstone. It's just worth remembering that the occasional observer might be blown up by the TNT. Oh man, he's got stuff going on all over the place here. Oh yeah, stuff's happening. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> okay, so he uses the... Oh, I fall down. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixorifs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Lately on Empire's SMP, I've been doing good deeds for our Emperor, who it turns out might not be in charge for much longer. In the meantime, there's a link to that video in the end screen theatre. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.